the positions I've had with Houston Audubon, I started out um, first doing some volunteer work, volunteer legal work on a donation, a proposed donation to Houston Audubon. And then I went on the board and was serving as, I became uh, president-elect after in my second year on the board. This was around 99. And then, uh, then, then I ended up moving over temporarily to be executive director, and that ended up being three and a half years. And then I went, after things stabilized, I moved back on the board as president-elect and served as president um, of the board the six, the six years, which is elect, president, and then passed. It's a six-year commitment. So it was a total of, I think, 10 or 12 years uh, in those various positions. I, I subscribed to the National Audubon Magazine. When I got out of law school and moved to Houston, I just, I'd always been interested in birds and had bird feeders at home and enjoyed birding in the neighborhood with my children. And so I uh, subscribed to National Audubon. Well, all of a sudden, I started receiving newsletters from Houston Audubon. Um, you know, uh, not a very sophisticated affair in those days, but talked about a place called Bolivar Flats. Uh, what is that? And But because of that communication, I uh, started taking beginning birding lessons through Houston Audubon. And so that put me out in the birding community. And one day I was at um, Russ Pittman Park. The word got out on, on text birds. We had something called a, a uh, listserv called text birds. And text birds said something about a bird being sighted there. So I trotted right over there and... Uh, I love and I love birders are so chatty and friendly. So Peggy Boston, who was very active with Houston Audubon, uh, sidled up to me and started chatting and asking questions. And pretty soon I was giving her my phone number uh, when she learned I was a lawyer. And it wasn't long after I had a phone call from Winnie Burkett <laughs> asking if I might do some uh, legal help them with a, a transaction. So that volunteer work, it was that particular project was a donation of the Carolyn Rays Davis Sanctuary down on, on Chocolate Bayou that Scott Davis was, was wanted to make that donation. So that was my first project and that was what got my, the, my attention from the, the board. Jeff Mundy was the new board, board president and that led to my being asked to go on the board. Well, I did real estate work primarily, <laughs> in fact, almost exclusively. Um, and I, I had done a lot of land acquisition, particularly for Aleph ISD and for Exxon, too, for, for smaller, you know, not big developments, but commercial development of their, what they called Exxon shops. So I was very comfortable, you know, being at, you know, taking on real estate and uh, said that in you know, that got me in that role, and then once on the board, I really, I guess, I'm, like I said, I think it was only in the second year that then we, there were major changes without going into details, and we, ended, we, we needed, we actually hired someone for executive director. The board made the hire, and I was on that committee. It did not work out, and I felt really bad about it for the staff, who then were leaderless again, and, and so I, when Jeff Mundy asked me if I might help out, I stepped over and, and started doing that. Well, there was, Jeff was a very dynamic board president and every opportunity to save land, to acquire land, he was all for it. So the Carolyn Davis, um, you know, that transaction was the first one, the next one followed short, you know, almost immediately was a donation by Dr. Clayton and his wife of the Dos Vacos Muertos Sanctuary on Galveston Island. So that was the next transaction. And in every transaction, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of visiting the land, talking to the people, um, and, and then celebrating the acquisition, you know, the fun part. Uh, then uh, the, the, we were going through a lot of 
building and transitioning of the not only the uh, you know, of the staff, uh, but the board and. Uh, Trying to think the next, and then probably the next land project. I mean, it was just one after another, and sometimes several at a time. But the next one, Winnie wanted me to help with a uh, the tire tract at Bolivar Flats, which we had a three seven four sevenths interest in. So then, it turned out to be a fairly complicated, long drawn out thing. We did a we did a partition where we ended up full owner of, I think it was 400 something acres, and the other owner of the three seventh was bought, was out. So that was the next one, and then pretty soon the, the really the big one, which was um, acquiring, uh, well, already underway was acquisition in bankruptcy court of 600 something acres of Bolivar, on Bolivar, of Bolivar Flats, which, had started out, Bolivar Flat started out as just a lease with the GLO. And so we actually didn't own land except for Tyra Tract. And there was another one called the Suterban Tract, which was before me and I didn't do much with it. But then the opportunity to acquire what was substantially most of what Bolivar Flats is now was, um, it was you know, came, became available through the bankruptcy court. And that was underway when I came on. So I didn't do much legal work on that. It ended up, ended up being involved in the closing. But the, um, the fundraising was the big thing there. There was a lot of fundraising that was going on to be able to, to pay for that. And uh, there, there was a, we did outreach to the United, everywhere, the whole country, and people really jumped in. So that was very satisfying, very... But then the bankruptcy court said, well, how about this other 600-something acres across the road here, Horseshoe Marsh? So we took that on, and that, that took us about three years, I think. It was, that was tough. It was over 4,000 lots because it had been a, some kind of crazy proposed development there that a lot of the lots were even underwater, under the, under the lake. But the... Uh, uh, Winnie, and, Winnie and I did that side by side, plotting through lot by lot. And she and her husband actually were the ones that on the ground to determine which lots we we we, we knew there were squatters there. We knew there was part we we didn't we did not want. So we um, we really cherry picked it. And Winnie and her husband did that on the ground work, and I was doing the, the paperwork. Our title, uh, you know, the the title opinion from the from the title company was this thick. And we were plotting, we, we went through all that. But anyway, we got, that was the next thing, and that was all-encompassing. That was, that took the, pretty much the, uh, anyway, we, we eventually closed on that. And at the same time, the, the, the as I'm remembering it, the uh, Bolivar Flats portion, it all, we just all closed it at the same time. So those are the, the major things. So what, I, what we ran into were um, the issues that began to come up for as far as I was concerned, because I, in, in addition to these acquisitions, we were dealing with um, land that we owned that were, that were, that were problematic. <laughs> you know, uh, eagerness to accept land by prior administrations meant that there were they were really difficult, hard to access, too far away, and just problematic pieces that we needed to figure out diff- better ways to utilize. And one really, one that I loved doing was we had a uh, tract north of Spring Creek, I think it was Montgomery County, and it was, it was landlocked by a development. And so we ended up doing a a trade with the developer and let him let the developer have that landlocked plot, and and they gave us land all along Spring Creek that they couldn't build on anyway. So it was mutually beneficial, and then we ended up being very involved in the Spring Creek Greenway project, and were part of the big you know, ceremonies that ended up being the when that all came together, and and was we cut the ribbon. So that was an exciting project um, that's
at the time that we were acquiring these different lands, we were we were we just felt like we were doing great conservation. We were excited to do it, and we had a strong leader in Jeff Mundy who was all for it. And and I don't remember any particular debate on the particular on the projects. And as the you know, as the executive director, I began to have concerns because I was having to deal with the problematic ones that had been accepted by earlier, you know, earlier administration, earlier group, earlier boards. Uh, it, and so the whole issue of, for me, became and that we and that we had developed during my term was, you know, how do we quit acquiring land in such a reactive way and start being more proactive about it, and uh, and and so we uh, we had some funds available to us, a very generous donation made by a woman named Jean Graham that we uh, set up as what we called a land fund to help us you know, pay for land that we felt like, to help us be able to take advantage of opportunities without having to say, wait, can we, we've got to raise some money. But, you know, let it, we, 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 would, we needed to be able to grab, you know, get po- properties quickly rather than having to raise the funds and lose opportunities that way. Uh, so the whole concept of, of having a plan, a proactive plan, and funds available was what we had in mind. We weren't able to get that project off the ground to actually come up with a land plan. We started that process. We called Linda Sheed, came and consulted with us, and we we weren't, didn't get that done, but it has been done since. I'm very pleased, I was very pleased to see that Houston Audubon, and just in recent the recent past, you know, published their a, a land plan after they got some funding from the Land Trust Alliance that supported the concept of them having a, a, a real plan that included, and here's another topic that I got involved with regarding land for Houston Audubon, which was I was invited to be, the whole land trust movement was beginning. It was the Texas Land Trust Council was under the uh, the wings of Texas uh, uh, t- TPWD, and so I was asked to be on that. It was actually representing Houston Audubon, but technically not. But it was with the heads of other leaders of conserva- land conservation groups, and so the concept of conservation easements we began to discuss and whether you know do we want to instead of having to go out and buy and own it and manage it, maybe we can save more land by, by accepting conservation easements. There's a lot of educating to do, educating ourselves, training, and, and um, so the current, you know, Helen and more recent boards have done a great job of following that path, and now Houston Audubon is a certified land trust. Uh, so all of that comes out of that Kind of wild, the wild and crazy days, we were just taking, you know, grabbing land and trying to figure out with what, what to do with what we had, and uh, it. I think it's been a. But with regard to difference be, uh, between Houston Audubon and other chapters, I really became aware of that when I went on the National Audubon Board, and just to say how I got on that board first, it it was an elected position. National Audubon's board is set up to have elected representatives from regions. So I represented Texas, Oklahoma, Colorado, New Mexico, a ridiculously large, impossible to represent all of them. (laughs) But when I went on that board, and I was on it for six years, two terms, and it was elected, all the chapters elect them, vote for it. But um, I became aware that Houston Audubon had owned more land than any other chapter in the country. And it was highly respected. I, I never had that perspective till I you know, got you know, out of just our, our world here. And um, it, it, uh, it really stands out from, from other chapters in its willingness. And the gutsy ones who started this were the ones that bought High Island. That's where the real, and I'm sure, I hope you've already heard that story probably from Winnie or others who were here. I wasn't part of it, but I heard about it. And uh, but that tradition of being gutsy and stepping out and doing it, finding the money, started there and 
then we pretty we, we continued in that certainly with Jeff Mundy as a strong leader. Uh, we had you know we had we had some big disappointments too. There was a huge track next to High Island called the Cade Ranch that just slipped right through our fingers because we were we're out there competing with developers, and the developer kind of went around us and went to the uh, seller and said. Oh, we'll just sign this country. You will sign this contract. We were trying to negotiate the, you know, the the negative stuff out, but no, it was gone. It was gone. Fortunately, it was saved later by um, a conservation fund, and I'm happy to say Houston Audubon was able to support that with a substantial donation from our land fund that Gene Graham had had helped us set up. So all of the land work, the land acquisitions were just really uh, uh, exciting, hard work, very satisfying. There's no feeling like standing and looking out over a beautiful coastal prairie or beach or whatever and say, or marshes, it's like, wow, it's safe. We did, we did it, it's done. So that there was just, for me, that was hugely satisfying and to be able to use my legal skills for something where I felt like was for for the good, not just to make money for my client and me. One day Jeff Mundy came here to the sanctuary and I was outside watering. Much as I had to do, I was still was out there watering because we didn't have enough staff. And he said, no, no, this won't do. So he set up a lunch with Flo Hanna, who he'd heard, he knew he knew her and he'd heard that she might be interested in working for us. So we went and had lunch, and we hired her at lunch. And she came to work half-time as a conservation assistant, I think she was called. Um, but she was just made huge contributions. And so she's the one that would, um, it would you know, many trips down to the Carolyn Davis Sanctuary, different places. She was the one that helped us manage those sanctuaries better and take better care of them. But she, I think particularly with regard to the Carolyn Davis Sanctuary down in Brazoria County, uh, is, there's not far from there, it, it was a coastal prairie, I've forgotten the name of it. Very, uh, anyway, she got very interested in coastal prairies and, uh, and Mike Lang with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was in charge of a Columbia Bottomlands uh, project down there. And so she got to know him, and and Houston, and Houston Audubon ended ended up giving U.S. Fish and Wildlife a conservation easement on our Carolyn Davis Sanctuary. So it's part of that Columbia Bottomlands project. But that work down there, I think, is where she got, be, began to really ap appreciate the importance of saving prairies, as coastal prairies. And so the, the there was a prairie west of Houston and called it um, what, Psalms Road near, I guess not, maybe near Katy, but west of Houston. And it was, it was too late. She'd been watching it and then all of a sudden it was too late and it was, it was gone. It was going to be, um, I've forgotten the exact particulars. It might, it might have even been Harris County was going to do something with it, that there was no saving it. But she got permission for us to go out there and save the plants. And so it was a huge effort to go out there and dig, dig up prairie plants that were going to disappear, and they were harder and harder to find. So with, that was became a very high recognition cause that brought together uh, not just conservation enthusiasts and other other organizations and enthusiasts within in it, like Jaime Gonzalez at Cary Prairie Conservancy. They, I, we had a meeting here in, this, in Houston Audubon bringing those disparate groups together to talk about we've got to save the prairies. Everyone's been, we've been focusing on everything else, but the prairies need attention because they're going fast. And uh, so the Psalms, Psalms Road was our rallying cry, kind of like remember Psalms Road never again became the the way that the, this prairie movement began. And really, I credit Flo. She is the one who started it. Actually, interestingly, there is a, even now, on, I, I became aware of it the other day because I, I went to a little function 
at, at a residence on South Braveswood. And across the street is a, a prayer, a little uh, pocket prairie, they call it. And someone said, did you know your picture's over there? And I said, no. And so we walked across, and there's a, a Psalms Road plants are there, and the story is there in a you know, nice post and very well done. It's been there a long time now. And there's actually is actually a photo of me there that I and with her daughter, the uh, so they went. That's where those plants went. They they found homes for them everywhere in Pocket Prairies, other organizations, and that ability to uh, you know to not to save and then to propagate from their flow went to to the prop propagating and then making those available to you know. For our, pro for our properties as well, and making them available to other properties. And out of that came the, you know, Houston Audubon's Native Plants Nursery that we have here, and I think now it's also at High Island. So the flow's reach has been enormous. Uh, the, uh, her imprint's all over everything, but she, she was kind of publicity shy. It was very hard to get her to ever speak in front of a group, but she was the one that making it happen. Uh, that this was, it wasn't just the, the, the city and the Parks Department being negligent and letting weeds grow, that you know, a lot of public education that had to go with it. Um, and I think that's, that's still a, a, a challenge out there. Yeah, definitely. But uh, the, her, the native plant grow, you know, nursery is just a phenomenal how successful that is and how much demand there is now. So that that, that really, there just wasn't much of that happening until Flo and Jaime and others, they're, they're, it's a very, they're very organized now. After I did my time on the National Audubon Board, and I was also on the Audubon Texas Board, I was kind of exhausted and just said, no more, no, no more, board, work, no more board work for me. But I did go on their uh, land conservation committee and that was, uh, I, I was very impressed with the work that went on there because that was the acquisition that's been recently completed uh, uh, by the old Amico properties uh, that, that kind of filled, filled out our High Island properties. I, they added 600 acres, something like that. It's, and that was very complex. I, then By then I had gone inactive with the state bar, so. The only legal advice I could give was you really need to get a lawyer, be sure we've got a lawyer on this. So they did, they, they uh, had a lawyer working with them on it. They got that completed and it was very, I'm so impressed that they got that done. Uh, and, that, and, all, and then the improvements that that, that committee uh, yeah, worked, worked on all, all the plans for the improvements that went there, the elevated walkway, Bathrooms, thing, you know, restrooms, all those things that we never, we always wished we had. So that was, I was very impressed with that, the Land Conservation Committee, and the work that Richard, my goodness, Richard Gibbons was to, just was a fantastic leader of that, along with uh, Sam Smith, the board president at the time, it was uh, he was a strong leader of that effort. So I, I participated in all of that, but just as a, as a committee member. When I first started here, we had volunteer. Our, our bookkeeper was volunteer. Every, almost everything was volunteer, and uh, and then you know, the, over time, those positions were filled with with professionals who could you know we could rely on uh, for more time. And and but the volunteers were just critical during my time for sure. But it, it seems to me they they do a beautiful job now and by um, the and, and management of so in soliciting and managing volunteers i think that's one of houston Audubon's strongest definitely strongest you know characteristics that they and we couldn't have done what we did without volunteers there's no way um, but i'm very impressed with what they're doing now with their youth advisory council oh my goodness that is just brilliant. I don't know who thought of that. But I've already had occasion to meet 
uh, Lucas and, and on a project, and I, I just am very impressed with that. And I, I think, and that's, that's bringing the cultural and ethnic diversity and youth that, that not just East Anatomy, but all conservation organizations need sorely. Yeah, and that was just a really good move. Um, and I think we have yet to see whether those move up into leadership on the main board. I certainly hope that that, that certainly seems logical that they would, and then I hope that that, that is the case, because that, that's going to save, save conservation organizations. We can't just being, keep being older uh, <laughs> uh, and... Uh, the women have tended to be the worker bees. The women have not tended to be in the leadership. Um, and Houston Audemont's a good example. Uh, we're strong women leaders, but just not as many as I would like to have seen on the board. Um, but that Youth Advisory Council, that is that is just brilliant. Yeah, I'm so I'm so impressed with Houston Audubon right now. It's beyond my wildest dreams. Even when I came over here today, and I thought, oh, all the things we dreamed of, they've happened, and more, and more. They were, uh, I, my understanding was that they had been birthed by Houston Audubon early on. And, and when I came on, they had, they had uh, kind of made a break, and they were new and kind of getting, getting on their feet. But the, the, the concept was, it was a great concept, what they were doing, setting up partnerships all, you know, all over with Latin America and, and, and a lot of the Gulf. Uh, and so uh, we, they were forming a new vision in Houston Audubon. We, we were just you know, trying to work out a mutually beneficial arrangement. I think there was some uh, wistfulness that, you know, that because Houston Audubon, it, it's like it took our, uh, the research arm that we hoped we would have, and we birthed it, and, and it went away. But it's, it's always all for the good. And, and what came out of what I enjoyed particularly is that and the, we were partnered with, GCBO had partnered, partnered us with a group in the Yucatan. And so we, um, it, it, I took a, a group of board members when I was executive director uh, to on a GCBO uh, with a G GCBO leader, um, Ian, I've forgotten his last name, and we went to the Yucatan and met with our our, our partner organization down there. It was a fabulous experience going into the um, to the research station in the jungles there, and uh, the and then out of that came. Houston Audubon supporting the Yucatan Bird Festival that they were trying to get on their get on its feet down there, and we went several years and board members we supported financially, and because that's just such an important the relationship the birds the birds there or the birds here they, you know, before they before they get here they've stopped a lot of them right there in the Yucatan to fly across the Gulf, so conservation down there is extremely important. And so they were doing a, a valiant effort to get uh, the Yucatan itself to appreciate that importance and importance of tourism, bird tourism. And uh, I think that that relationship has kind of gone away, but I felt it was an important part of what, what I was doing here anyway. A concern that I have for Houston Audubon, for all conservation organizations, and especially because of my involvement at, with National Audubon, because uh, National Audubon has recently gone through you know, a very um, a challenging time. They've been challenged a great deal, and a lot of heads have rolled, frankly, over the fact that uh, they, the lack of ethnic and cultural diversity in the organization. Anyway, it's going to take effort, but I think we have to do it. And I'm happy to say Houston Audubon is doing that. They've, they've, they're getting started at that. They're being smart about it. And I think they're going to be successful at it. And, but it, it is a challenge for all of the conservation groups, definitely. It's a, we're mostly represented by relatively well-off uh, 
white people older. I mean, that's just how that, that can't, we can't continue to be effective unless we can enrich ourselves with more diversity. It's, it's not the thrill that I've, I've learned the, the, the earlier stages when you're discovering. And that's the reason it's fun to travel and you just get, you get to you know, experience new, you know, new birds. I think the, um, the, the researchers, the people who are willing to go out and do bird surveys, and oh, and, oh, and I bird surveys, I, I established a bird survey and did it for years, and I strongly believe and how important that is, is outreach to the community and also for da providing data. Uh, but I think the part I was really enjoying about that was bringing, bringing in the community and getting to know people and spreading the word because you are seeing pretty much the same birds all the time. And so I, I, uh, it's diff it just get, it's different. It, it's different, and as we get older too. It, it, uh, and also it's become, it's a different experience now because we have, instead of interacting with others about where birds are seen, we're uh, interacting with, it's very, per it used to be much more personal, now it's with your phone, with your apps, you know, it's eBird, it's, it's you know, Cornell, th th those things, and that's, that's interesting, but it's just not as much fun for me as it used to be when it was a much more social, personal experience with other people you know, having fun together. I have three grandchildren, and uh, they, uh, two of them in particular, one in particular, they, <laughs> the docent gill ladies that remembered her as the, 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 the snake granddaughter because she came to the summer camps here and she loved the snakes. I have pictures of her with a snake around her neck. Uh, one, one thing that has just been such a joy for me is that I, uh, none of them became birders. But I had a nephew who lives in Washington, D.C., who when he was like eight years old, he came home from school and was all excited about birds. And his dad, my brother, said, uh, well, you know, your Aunt Joy is president of Audubon or some sort of thing that I wasn't. But uh, so, so one night, he'd seen an owl in their yard. And so this little boy, my little nephew, called me about it. He was so excited. So he ended, you know, we, the, you know, the Texas Birding Classic has youth teams. So he came down several years in a row as just a little tyke and was on, and Cindy Matters and I took these kids out. Her, she had, I think, children, and we had other children in it. Sarah Betancourt's boy was part of them. Took those kids out and did the birding competition. It was so much fun. And so that nephew, he and I, over the years, have had a bit special relationship because he still is a big birder and is marrying next month a woman who is birding, birding brought them together. So, yeah, I've had the, the pleasure of seeing that in my grandchildren and, in, and this nephew, too. Uh, that's really fun to see, to see the next generations get really excited about it. Yeah.